The Club Championship Show on OTB in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest. Welcome along to the Club Championship Show here on OTB Sports, brought to you by AIB. It is AIB All-Ireland Club Final Day at Croke Park this coming Sunday. And it's going to be Ulster against Leinster in both of the senior deciders. In the hurling, Ballyhale Shamrocks have the opportunity to land what will be a record ninth title, with Dunloy seeking a maiden crown, having lost out in four previous finals. Like Shamrocks, Kimiko Croaks come into the football final on the back of late goal heartbreak last year in the decider. Standing in their way this coming Sunday are Derry's first time All-Ireland finalist Glenn on the back of their maiden provincial title. We'll be joined by Morris Brosnan and by Michael Verdi to break down where both games are going to be won and lost on Sunday afternoon and we'll have reaction from last week's intermediate and junior finals as well. Delighted to say Asha Riley is with us remotely today. Asha, how are you getting on? Not too bad, Will. How are you? Um, not too bad. We've got Michael Verney with us as well. Mick, how are you? How's it going, folks? We're going to start off with the hurling um, straight away, Michael. This is Ballyhill Shamrocks after the Harry Ruddle goal last February back 11 months later into an All-Ireland final again, potentially making a piece of history in winning a ninth title. Uh, they are the odds-on, overwhelming favourites going into this weekend. Is it fair that the Kilkenny champions are considered such favourites? Ah, sure it is, Will. Realistically, when you look down through it, like take Harry Ruddle's goal away and Bally Hale, and, and COVID away and Ballyhale could potentially be going for an All-Ireland five in a row. Um, that's the only game they've lost within that spell of time and obviously there was no provincial and all Ireland campaign in 2020 uh, amid COVID so they are the hottest of favourites for a reason I would say and it's just I think it's so interesting as well it's kind of just thinking it's the, it's a, been a five year cycle since Henry Shefflin took over and they obviously didn't lose a, a knockout game went on a fantastic run uh, won back to back all Ireland's and then you know a change of manager and James O'Connor comes in and they're able to win another county title in pretty comprehensive fashion they had some turbulence, you'd probably say, along the way to the All-Ireland Final, but they produced their best in the All-Ireland Final again, and they were obviously beaten by that goal at the end. But then they changed managers uh, again, and they're able to keep things, keep the train on the tracks. I think that's one of the most remarkable things about it all. If you think about it, if you know if Kilkenny had changed manager after they beat Cork in 06, would we have, would we have seen the, the four in a row and potential five in a row that followed if... Phil Jackson had left the Bulls in 96, would they have been able to do the, the repeat, three-peat? Like, what they've been able to do while uh, the the personnel on the line has changed, the principles on the pitch and the play on the pitch has managed to stay the same, which is really remarkable within this run. Yeah, I remember reading an article, Michael, uh, I think it was Colin Fenley, and he was saying that you know, he's watching on it, like them winning the minor titles there a few years ago. And he got so excited by it and said, Jesus, you know, we need to keep our standards up like these lads are, are coming through. So I suppose it's that knock on effect. Yeah. And as well as that, like as good as those young guys are coming through and even you have like Niall Short all this year um, coming through and kind of making it, making a burst. They'll all tell you that it's Colin Fenley, it's TJ, it's Joey Holden that are probably driving the standards in the dressing room. And to have those guys as hungry as ever, like Colin Fenley to me definitely looks like a man on a mission. He said after after February that you know, he had no interest in hurling really. He obviously went off to, to San Fran, him and Joey Holden were out there and uh, Joey had no intention of coming back at all. Uh, he was going traveling the world for a couple of years and, and, and is going to after this final. Um, but they're all back on board. They're the ones that are steering the ship, I suppose, uh, keeping the standards high, as you say. And like I just remember chatting on Cody after one of the games. I think it was after the Castletown Gagan game, and I think he ended up at something like two ten or something like that. And we just said, you know, you had a great game or whatever. And he just says, well, I don't think Colin Fenley would think I had a great game. Like he, he basically would tell me that I got the goals when it didn't matter when the game was over in the second half. That's the standards. <laughs> That's the standards you're talking about. And. Um, I suppose when you look and you see particularly those three marquee older guys and you see how much they're driving it and driving it with their performances on the pitch, Joey was outstanding the last day. And although he had a, a, couple, a, a few tough minutes on Desi Hutchinson early, like I thought he got the better of that, that duel and even forced Desi out the pitch thereafter. When those guys are driving it to that level, it just you just kind of I've seen it with Burr down through the years. The older lads can just bring the young fellas along. That look, looks like what's happening here. And it's a great sign for the next Ballyhale team, the next generation, that they're kind of been exposed to that as well. And uh, like, there's no point in saying any different. They, they look 
like they're going to be really, really difficult to beat on Sunday. Yeah, I think in the semi-final as well, Mick, we saw a championship performance against Ballygunner from them. You mentioned how good Joy Holden was that day, but generally they upped the performance compared to the game against Kilmacher Crokes in Leinster, where that performance was far from complete. They drifted out of the game in the second half, but yet they looked far more back to the Valley Hale of old when we saw them the last day. Yeah, and it's funny, Will, like going back through it, they lost Darren Mullen after six minutes. You know, they're they're you know a brilliant cornerback and a brilliant ball player as well. They lost Joey Cuddy after about 13 minutes. Um, and I know they, it's gas how teams just love any sort of motivation or anybody writing them off in any way. They would have said because they brought on nobody against Kill McCood. A lot of people were saying that, you know, their panel depth wasn't great. They had to go straight into their panel. And it's almost like they reveled in that or, in, you know, enjoyed kind of proving people wrong. But that was an ultimate team performance. We'd seen probably half an hour. We'd made, maybe seen 40 minutes in some games. We'd probably seen 15 or 20 uh, in some of the Kilkenny games where we saw probably the complete performance that they needed. And it was just, I don't know, looking at that last couple of minutes of the, the Bally Gunner game, it just felt like to me they were never going to concede. they just like a team. This was a shutout. This was something that they had bottled up since last February. And I suppose the interesting thing about the final now is they really built themselves up for that semi-final. And if you talk to anybody locally in Kilkenny, they would say, the psychological work that they done on on uh, on Bally Gunner and to get themselves up for that game and to I suppose to plug holes and get back and kind of squeeze out space during that game the psychological work that they done for that game as well as the physical was massive and there's at that high and they hit that high and now they have to still have to play a final and I think that's the really interesting thing from a Dunloy point of view um, if you look at it like Dunloy are massive massive underdogs going into going into Sunday's final. And, you know, on, on, on factual evidence, probably rightfully so. But you have a Dunlai, a Dunlai team who have, you know, they've, they've gotten that Schlock, Schlock Neil itch. They've scratched that in the Ulster final. They were, you know, like a cloud hanging over them in recent years. Massive outsiders. I think they were four to one against Thomas's in the semi final. Same going into the final. Like they have previous in this regard. They're used to being underdogs, they're used to being written off in big games. And, like Willie, I know. I, I think you were there. I don't know if you were there in '95. I'm sure you were definitely there in '03. Mm -hmm. Dunlay, Dunlay have underperformed in finals. Apart from the first one in '95, when Dottie Regan put over a, a point from midfield in a Which monsoon. Was a day was like today, Mick. It was uh, yeah, sleet yeah. and snow, but in the middle of March. Yeah, and it was thunder and lightning. I think and everything. And that was they missed their chance that day. And Bor were brilliant the second day. They underperformed against Six Mile Bridge the year after. Uh, they underperformed against Borough again in all three and probably against Newtown in all four. And I don't, they will be absolutely gunning for this on Sunday. They, like, I'm sure it hurts them and I'm sure they, they love the fact that there's another Antrim club or there's an Antrim club that has an All Ireland title in, in Loch Eel and two of them. But I'm sure like, they would have considered themselves the kingpins for so long and they'd, they'd, they will do anything to get that on Sunday. And uh, an interesting one as well, uh, Gregory O'Kane, the manager. I don't know if this is the case, and if you could say this is the case in many any other club, but they don't know. have won sixteen Antrim County titles since nineteen ninety, and obviously plenty of Ulster titles along the way, and loads of All Ireland final appearances. He's been involved in every single one of them, be it as a player or as a manager or a coach or selector. Um, so talk about having a guy that has that kind of Midas touch involved as well. But it's amazing to think that he's been involved in every success that Dunlay have had, and the sweetest one of them all will be Sunday if they can get over the line. Yeah, I remember speaking to Gregory um, after the semi-final and like just to have him, I think, as the, the guidance there, that he's been there, he's done it, he's a club man. And he said to me about Keelan Malloy, I know, Michael, you were sitting in front of me for that goal that is probably goal of the championship, but it's up there, the Keelan got in the semi-final. And he said if it was any other county, you know, everyone would know Keelan Malloy. Yeah, oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I, I was definitely off my feet anyway when that went in, <laughs> yeah. and, and it was so smart because he, he obviously caught the ball, so he had one catch. He, uh, he he picked it up around the 55. I think it was Nigel Elliott who made a catch, and he get a lovely little offload quick to him. But he had his two catches taken. I'm going to say about 30 or 40 yards from goal, so he just had the ball in the hurl and soloed through two tackles, like threw the ball on for himself because he couldn't take it in his hand again. Uh, yeah, like listen, you see it. Like if that had been, you know, a Joe Canning for Galway or Portumna or a TJ Reid or whatever, we probably would be talking about about it a bit more. I suppose it's the the nature of the 
the geographical exclusion nearly where where Dunloy are. It's nearly so far away. I know I've talked to lads before about how difficult it is even to get challenge games just because you know they're not going to be playing Schlock Neil the whole time. You nearly have to be coming down to Abbottstown or coming down to the middle of the country. There are a lot of disadvantages, shall we say, for particularly the likes of Dunloy up there and even the likes of Schlock Neil. But yeah, that was that was an unbelievable goal and like in Keelan Malloy, Conal Cunning. Uh, Sean Elliott, Nigel Elliott, you know, they have some serious players that can do damage. And I think the nature of their semi semi final win over Thomas's, like that wasn't like some sort of smash and grab or anything. Far from it. That was uh it was a solid first half performance where they obviously had a penalty missed and a few other bits and pieces, but it was a really dominant second half performance. And no matter what Thomas's were throwing at them in that second half of that game, uh there was going to be no stopping done lie. So they come into Sunday absolutely brimming with confidence. Yeah, last month we were talking about just the way that Dunloy had hurled and Conal Cunning was pulling the strings in a lot of ways. But pace in that forward line, they played very clever balls out wide into the space, particularly in the second half when the game started to stretch a little bit against St. Thomas's. But is it a different one to try and crack the nut that is the Ballyhale defence, given that they've just played against a really pacey forward line and a running game with Ballygunner the last day anyway? Yeah, 100%. And I think a lot of it is... Uh, to, in order to create that space obviously you have to have some sort of time on the ball to give in a good delivery from out the pitch and you probably want the, the Ballyhale half back line to be moved out of position uh, like there's a couple of things for certain like Evan Shefflin will will not move like he will keep that when they are not in possession he will keep he will keep his shape uh, same, with, same with Richie Reid and same with Dara Corcoran as well and the pressure probably coming from up the field on the delivery of the ball is going to be an awful lot higher. Like, Ballyhale would pride themselves on that, pride themselves on not leaving their defence exposed. If they do, the likes of Conal Cunning, Sean Elliott, as I say, Keelan Malloy, they will make hay. But I just don't... I see them being squeezed out an awful lot. I see a couple of those balls potentially been broken down by, you know, deep lie and half-backs and the quality of the ball coming in probably... It's going to be difficult for it to be as good as it was coming in against Thomas's, and it, it's funny because Cunning was finding it tough in that first half, and um, I think it was Keen Mahoney who was picking him up, was doing a quite a good job. But the ball coming in was probably sixty forty ish, whereas in the second half, the ball coming in was you know absolutely manna from heaven for a, in, an inside forward. Lovely ball, he nearly had time to take a touch and and go at his man, and he did, but. Like in, in like Joey Holden, uh, we don't know really about Darren Mullins' fitness. I know I was chatting to Adrian last week and he kind of said he he'd be he should he should be fit, but there's probably, you know, there's a, probably a doubt over him, a doubt over Joey could he could he could he as well. But I'd say probably Cunning will probably be picked up by by Joey <coughs> Holden, who did such a masterful job on, on Desi the last day. And realistically, the big Dunlai players, those big names that we know are gonna have to you know, they're gonna have to hit serious like Eight and a half, nine out of ten if, if Dunloy are to win this game. Yeah, Paul Shields is back from the back injury, which is good news. Some Aaron Crawford, though, missed out. He picked up an injury in his shoulder the last day. And I guess they need to have everyone playing incredibly well. The other thing I noticed as well, Mick, it's going to be a difficult day for Owen O'Neill, I would think. He was back with Antrim against Westmead, playing at the weekend in the Walsh Cup. But he transferred with the intention of travelling, went to London. I think he played a couple of games for Robert Emmett's couldn't transfer back to Dunloy in time for the Antrim Championship and he's going to be in the stands on Sunday. Unfortunately one for him, he's been such a key player for Dunloy for the last years. Oh, that's a, that's a very, very difficult one, yeah. Like, yeah. Sure, like he would have been doing everything possible over the last couple of years, to, as I said, to try and, you know, get over Schlock Neil or, you know, get over these obstacles and even up in, up in Antrim in, in recent years they would have had plenty <laughs> of uh, resistance from the likes of Cushendall and others. Uh, that's going to be a difficult one because it's the same as you know, if you're sitting in the stands with a knock or whatever it is, or you're ineligible for some reason, you always think you can make it. You can always think you can make a difference, and no doubt he would make a difference. So, um, a diff- difficult one. The tighter it is, the harder it's going to be for him because the more you could think you could do something or make a change within that game. So that's not going to be simple, all right. And from what you've said, you're thinking Bally Hale pick up their ninth title at the weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd, you'd make the case and play devil's advocate for Dunloy. And I think the fact that they they know how to, you know, they know how to perform a giant kill and, and perform it pretty well, uh, definitely in their last two games. But there's just, there's so many, um, there's so many holes that you have to plug when you're playing Bally Hale. Like Adrian Mullen has nearly taken over from, from TJ as the, you know, the driver of this Bally Hale team and will probably be the driver of it for the next 10 years, all going well, um, fitness permitting. Uh, Owen Cody the same 
And they, like if you you know you put specific attention on those guys, and then you know TJ just pulls the strings and dictates dictates affairs. Obviously, you have Colin inside who looks totally re-energized. I would say compared to last year. Um, I think Ronan Corkin is a big one as well. He obviously missed the final last year, and he was back against Bally Gunner la- uh, la- a couple of weeks ago, and that was obviously key. I think they have a pretty much a clean bill of health. They didn't have a, a clean bill of health really going into last year's final, and that probably caught them. But that was against you know a Bally Gunner team, you know one of the best club teams we you know we're ever likely to see. With due respect to Dunloy, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to hit those heights. They're going to need all their key men performing. Uh, at their optimum but realistically I just think it's like a death by a thousand cuts on what Bally Hale can hurt you so many ways and I think I, I think it will be tight but I think probably in the wind up probably Bally Hale by six to seven and before the Bally Gunner game Michael did you have any question marks over Bally Hale <laughs> sure I think I think they thrived on that didn't they Um, it was a 50-50 game but you're kind of thinking, oh, here's the Bally Gunner team. Bally Gunner are coming here. They got, you know, they've got over the, they've got their first All Ireland under their belt, and you have a Bally Hale team, and you're naturally, I think it's natural just to think, oh, you know, their graph is just kind of finishing now, or mm-hmm. you know, they're gonna maybe go off the radar a bit, and Bally Gunner are gonna take over. But I did have this, you know, that kind of good instinct where you're thinking, where you're thinking, ah, there's something, they're gonna produce something. And uh, they're going to produce something a lot better than we have seen already this season. So I always had that kind of feeling in my gut that they might produce something. And then, like after 15, 20 minutes, you know that's, that's a reality. So, um, and they, they don't really spurn these type of opportunities. As I said, in the last five, in the last five years, we've been beaten once. That was a last-minute mm-hmm. goal where there was literally no chance to respond. There was no comeback. Um, and... I, I, that would have hurt them and that would have drove them on and they've had a few weeks break over Christmas I'm sure a lot of those guys it's just it's not even doing hard training the likes of TJ and Joey and, and Colin Fenley it's just tipping over and making sure the body is right and making sure the mind is right and uh, yeah I don't see them I don't see them slipping up on Sunday Cheers Mick enjoy the finals of the weekend Thanks folks and you can read, of course, more from Michael Verney in the Independent around the final and after the final as well. The games that took place last weekend, let's have a look at the results from the hurling and the football. Uh, we'll start with the hurling championship games that were on last Saturday. So Bally Giblin of Cork coming back after being beaten in the final last year to overcome Eastky of Sligo, 116 to 11 points. And in the intermediate hurling championship final, we were talking to Andrew Latouche Cosgrave last week of Monoline. He was saying they were going to get a real test against Torino Mayo proved to be one of the best games of last weekend in any code 117 uh, to 115 cracking game of hurling at Crow Park and that intermediate hurling decider uh, but Monoline of Limerick going back to senior level for next season and going back as the All-Ireland Club intermediate hurling champions as well Kerry's dominance continuing in the football and much debate about um, the fact there's still only eight senior teams in Kerry at the moment uh, potentially helping them when it comes to intermediate football and junior football uh, but both the finals going as expected in the end uh, Fossa of Kerry in a game where there were red cards brandishes all over the place towards the end of the game Fossa coming through against Stewartstown Harps by 19 points to 113 in the Intermediate Football Championship final Ratmore of Kerry winners against Galvalli Pierces uh, Shane Ryan the Kerry goalkeeper very much in form in front of goal in that game uh, found the net as well 111 to 11 points they won that game so Kerry coming out on top against Tyrone in both those finals as uh, she were in Crow Park on Sunday watching the Junior Football and the Intermediate Football Championship finals uh, we were treated to two pretty decent games two hard fought games I would say as well yeah definitely the the first game was probably the more exciting of the two you know that was really end to end stuff well like I was so invested in it and they were just defending so well but attacking so well and yeah at times they they would go forward with the ball they get dispossessed they go back they get overturned this way it was just end to end constantly and you didn't know what way it was going to go like Foster were to go down it at half time it was seven points to one seven and you were thinking wow like Stewartstown they're full value here they're like really attacking minded the likes of Garrett Devlin he finished up with one five on the day and you know he was causing all sorts of problems getting that goal in the in the first half so you just didn't know what way it was going to go and they were doing what I thought was a good job on David Clifford in throughout the game and um, he still walked away with 11 points and yeah, just remarkable. But yeah, they, they tried their utmost best on him. Like at, at times coming out with the ball, there was five defenders on him. Like I remember all of us up in the press box, well, 
David was coming out with the ball, the five defenders run towards him and they're trying to dispossess him and he lays it off and we're all just like, wow, it's just, yeah, something else to see him with his club. But uh, such an interesting game. Like, and obviously at the end, we had the chaotic finish of six red cards and I was live on air and it was chaotic trying to say who got that and um, I wasn't even sure at times who got what because it happened all in one go other than 38 minutes gone the first red card for Stewart's down it changed the game a small bit but other than that it uh, yeah it was chaotic to say the least but uh, very entertaining yeah, and Paddy Fitzgerald, or Paddy Clifford as he really is, uh, called oh, Paddy Fitzgerald by the GA president as he was about to cup the cup, <laughs> was unfortunate. We were treated to one of the more unusual uh, full-time speeches where Paddy decided to take out his frustrations about being sent off. Now, <laughs> apparently they're considering a disciplinary action on the back of the speech, so we'll see what happens on that one. That was reported in the Irish Examiner uh, yesterday, but I don't think I've ever heard such a fortright speech where someone actually questions his sending off in the middle of a speech, because in years gone by, before the rule had changed, if you were sent off, you weren't going up as part of the presentation. Yeah, I actually, I, I think I forgot that or I didn't realise that, but I had seen the tweets afterwards and um, I was like, geez, imagine he wasn't able to actually go up and, and lift the cup. But I think with the speech, it was just raw emotion. And I'm sure when he watched it back, he probably thought, oh God, you know, maybe I should have left that. Maybe, who knows? But uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it was a lot at the time, but uh raw emotion went into it all like when I spoke to, to David afterwards he that's what he kept alluding to he said look I, whatever was on the pitch happened on the pitch and it was very much you know the emotion that goes into it all it is a, a junior final all Ireland final so there's you know massive emotion in this and a lot's riding on it Yeah David Clifford probably the coolest man in Crow Park last weekend this is what he had to say to Ash after the game in the tunnel in Croker ah, it's, it's, a, it's a special feeling um I suppose, look, especially the way the, the way the game materialised, the fact that we were, I suppose, under the cosh at halftime, um, coming out then, and I suppose when they went down to 14, it felt like we were going to kick on. Probably didn't do so as much as we were going to. Um, and then, I suppose, look to go on and, and get over the line. I know it was probably madness at the end, but sure, look, that's all part of it. It was madness at the end. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? There was six red cards out there. Two for, for Fossa, obviously yourself, you picked up one, Paddy picked up one. What was it in the end, I suppose, for you, is, is we're getting a lot of treatment out there? Ah, uh, look, I, don't, I wouldn't say that. Um, mine was, look, a second yellow, sure, look, I think anyone, anyone in the world would take that fall to try and stop them from going on, on, on a, on a counter-attack there. Um, not sure Paddy, no, to be honest, but, ah, uh, uh, look, sure, look, there, there's just so much emotion involved in the game. Um, it's just desperation, look, fellas are, fellas are, are doing things in the right spirits. You're going, you're going in maybe to, to make a hit to connect on a ball maybe and, and look if you mistime it slightly um, the way fellas are built now it's probably going to look worse when they're moving at so much speed so, so they put it down to and it was four red cards for them so I suppose in the end maybe they lost their heads a little bit you know as you said a lot of emotion goes into it exactly yeah look it, it's, it's difficult I suppose look if you put yourselves in, in, in their shoes you're up at half time um, and you can feel things starting to slip away if you're, you'll do anything to try and turn the tide so again like I said it's probably just I don't, I don't even know whatever lunging into a tackle or whatever look I suppose it'll, uh, if someone didn't watch the game will probably look at it and say, geez, that must, have been a, that must have been a nasty game. But it wasn't really like that. I think there was good football played. So, yeah. Brilliant football. Like yeah. It was such attacking football. Both teams were defending so well. So exciting to watch. I think anyone that came into Crow Park today, they really got a good entertaining game. Uh, yeah, I suppose you'd hope so. Look, we, we, were, we were very conscious of the fact that they just came down from intermediate. Um, and look, we were possibly a team that are maybe on the up a small bit. So we knew that was, it was going to be at a good level. Um, but yeah, just to get over the line is, is, is brilliant, yeah. David Clifford there in conversation with Ash. So there's a three-point win for Fossa against Stewartstown Harps. Also a three-point win for Ratmore against Galbali Pierce's 111 to 11 points. Aidan O'Mahony, his tweet afterwards indicated he's now uh, retiring from club football. He's in hurling management next season. Uh, 42 years of age at this stage, Aidan O'Mahony. And this is what he had to say to Ash at the full-time whistle. I, I think it was the most nervous of weekends I've ever been coming up here to Crow Park. I've played in I think, nine or ten finals up here and um, this one was definitely the most tense. I think... It's a very special weekend. We came up on Saturday and uh, the group of, I think, 42, I think nearly 50, including management. And I think the young lads, they're a breath of fresh air with us. Um, but it, it's, it's, I suppose, in my mind, even going to bed last night, you're kind of hoping and hope that you get over the line for all those young lads coming through. And uh, like they did that today, there was times you're kind of saying, will we, won't we? But I think it's a lot easier playing than actually standing in the sidelines. So, yeah, it, it, it was a very, very special day. I was watching you on the sideline there and you were sort of still almost coaching 
the, the back line, you know, you were like, keep your heads calm, keep it going. Obviously, there was a goal in it and it was, it was so nice to watch, I suppose, at that point that you're still able to do that and you're able to, you know, encourage the lads at that point. It's so nerve-wracking on the sideline, as you said. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know where they're listening to me, but yeah, I suppose I've been in that situation and, and we spoke about it before the game where at times in games you're going to find yourself one and one or 2v2 inside there and it's a case of you need level heads and you need to hold your shape and when the, I suppose the waves are coming in like they did in Galbally, they never gave up and that was going to come and it's just trying to keep players focused because at times, you know, in, in that kind of situation when you haven't been there before, it can be tough but as I said, I don't know where they're listening to me but um, they were brilliant today, like uh, each and every one of them, even the players that came on, you know, they stood up, um, we had a very close talk there at half time and it was very special and I knew going out in the second half that they wouldn't be being, and that's not being arrogant, I just, I, I've known these lads all year and they had adversity in games and where we could have been beaten and maybe should have been beaten down in Kerry and the year they've put in and then to come up again today against Gal Bally and we knew what they were going to bring, we knew the intensity, the tackling and um, for our lads it's, it's just very sweet and I suppose it's, it's a bit surreal at the moment to actually know that we're going back down to a small community in Kerry on the border with Cork um, with an intermediate and all our entire and it was like Bally Gibbon last night I just see him and um, the bonfires and stuff it's, it's very sweet to experience that and really looking forward now to the next couple of days yeah, remarkable homecoming uh, which they had on Monday, which was generally following along on Aidan O'Mahony's Twitter account, uh, where he was putting the videos up from it. And his tweet that went up on Sunday night as well, where it all started to where it finished, 1997 to 2023. So 26 years as a senior player uh, with Rat Moore. Um, he goes out wearing the number 26 jersey, Ash. He goes out maybe not in the prominent position he would have had with the club uh, when he was a big star on the Kerry team. Uh, but there's a guy still giving back to his club, even into his 40s. Oh, remarkable, Will. Big time, like, to see him on the sideline in Crow Park. You would have liked to have seen him maybe got a run even the last few minutes, but there was a goal in it, so it was it was really tight. But to see how invested he was, he wasn't looking at the management to try to get on for those last few minutes. He was very much talking to the lads, keep your heads, we nearly have it, we nearly have it. You know, that's what he was invested in. And, yeah, he gets to walk away from his playing years with his club with an All-Ireland title and he said he would have given up any of the Kerry medals to have one with his club you know but that's what it means to him it's very very special for him he said that you know when we got relegated I was there when we got relegated so I wanted to be there to bring us back up to senior and he was and yeah he's been a remarkable player and um, for Kerry and for Ratmore and yeah just delighted for him and um, it's just it's a brilliant story 42 years of age Jesus we'd only hope you could be still playing at that age you know it's just something else. Yeah, it's a photo book, mo- photo book moment even to finish in the stands in Crow Park uh, with your club and with an All-Ireland title. And that's the joy of uh, these finals being at Crow Park every year as well. The, the match itself, I mean, Ratmore, it seemed to me you said very tense, but I thought they were the better team. A much better team. Even though it ended in a goal, you probably wouldn't have thought of that. And it's not to say that Galbally Pierces weren't you know, a brilliant team. They really were. But I thought Ratmore had that bit more. Um, especially the the Ryan brothers, you know, I spoke to AJ, or Dennis Moynihan, the manager after the game, just about the Ryan brothers, of course, Mark and Cahill in midfield, and they'd be two brothers, so Shane Ryan, who plays obviously in goals for Kerry, he played up front and he was brilliant. I was excited to see him playing outfield for his club, I hadn't seen him yet, and he scored one three, picked up man of the match, and the second half he was down in the back line, he did his cross field ball, you know, across the pitch um, in the second half, really when they needed a good ball inside and they got a score from it. And I just thought, geez, he's brilliant outfield. He really can can do it all. And there was talk afterwards with, with Dennis that, you know, he said that Jack O'Connor should be bringing all the three brothers into the, the Kerry team for next year. So we'll watch out for that one. Um, but yeah, they were full value. And as well, Chrissy Spears there in the half forward line. He's a, a dairy man. He moved up there with his girlfriend. She's from there, so they got lucky with that one because he was he was fun. He was brilliant on yesterday or last weekend as well, or at the weekend. He was brilliant. So he was. I think he scored three points, and he has been all season. So yeah, they got very lucky with him coming into their side. But uh, yeah, overall, really, really strong team, and yeah, full value for their win. Delighted to say we've got Morris Brosnan from the Irish Examiner with us now as well to look forward to the All-Ireland Senior Football Final uh, this coming Sunday where first time since 95 Morris we've got Derry against Dublin Kilmacook Crokes will be 
hoping that's a good sign because the first time they went up to lift the cup was in 95 when it was Derry against Dublin potentially they could win their third title and potentially they could banish some of the demons we were talking last week about Robbie Brennan their manager still having the screensaver of killed coup which shows maybe how much the last year has haunted them uh, but potentially they could put that behind them by uh, lifting the All-Ireland title on Sunday afternoon Yeah it's funny Will I was actually just thinking this this morning that you know if you go back uh, 20 years ago let's say and you look at the the All-Ireland finals or the teams who are winning finals particularly um, like you know uh, you go back to 2002 the last Derry team I think it was Banderry Shamrocks uh, they did they win one Ulster again maybe but they were never coming close to another Ireland final uh, you go to Caltra won it in 2004 they bet on Gwell took actually from, from Kerry neither of those teams won a county title again they're actually both into media clubs right now a year later Ballina I think they won one more Mayo title after that a year after that then you're talking about oh such an after from Galway uh, they won one more county title. They're actually in a county final this year, but haven't come close to an Ireland final since. And then after that, it changes. Like there's a real heavy change, and you start to see teams are coming. You know, there's, there's what we would call dynasties. Like we saw St. Gauls coming, we saw Cross McGlen coming, Vincent's after them. And the great thing about it is, is that as all these teams are coming, you see the next branch, so to speak, coming behind them too. So just for example. Uh, you know, Vincent's when Casabar had their success, then they actually lost to Vincent's in a final. That Casabar team bet Carfin by a point in Tum Stadium. Carfin bounced back to that to, to rattle after three in a row. Carfin obviously famously bet Kilku. You saw Kilku come back and do them over a year later. Uh, when Kilku bet Kilmacud, and now you see Kilmacud coming back now. And the great thing I think about this final is that there's arguably there's two teams coming here. You know, there's we talked to a lot of people in Glen, and particularly about the, the minor ultra success that this club has had getting players home like Connor Glass on the other side then Kilman Cudd last year so there is you know it, it's kind of exciting both to speak if you were to look at the semi-finals this year of the four I'd say three of them you would not be surprised to see back at a similar stage again next year and that I think that there's potentially a dynasty building but as you know finals are there for winning and you just it just takes one for that to kick on so for both teams they both kind of have a cause they both you know as as much as I'm sure Kilman Cudd are sore about as you mentioned what happened last year like Glenn, you know, don't forget how much of a rattle Glenn gave him last year as well. So I think both teams definitely would certainly have earmarked this from the start for what they wanted, but and feel like they kind of belong on the stage, which which hopefully will lead to a, a fairly decent spectacle. Yeah, um, I had a feeling Shane Walsh was going to come up yesterday, Morris, when the captains were facing the media at Crow Park. And Shane Cunningham's comments are interesting because he was asked pretty directly about this: Are Croaks not getting the credit they deserve? And he said, "Quote: I'd say probably no, absolutely not. But does that bother me? No." absolutely not I just care about winning and maybe what your close family and friends think about it all that's what motivates me if anyone else is a viewing it they're entitled to it but it doesn't affect me now clearly saying it's not going to matter um, we don't pay any attention to outside noise about all this but clearly the players are incredibly aware of all of the discussion about Shane Walsh going back to last summer I'd say they are Will and uh, like credit from who is the thing that I would kind of look at there like who you know does, in a debate like this as often is the case both sides are firmly entrenched on where they are and there's no you're not going to change either side's mind so like t- I think people who understood why Shane Walsh did it will absolutely be given him good credit and other people are using it sick to beat him and they always will there's definitely there's an element of I would say I remember when Shane Walsh thing was first announced and there was people who were looking at it and were saying things like my um my junior B West Galway medal will mean more to me than anything that Shane Walsh will ever win for Kilmer Cud because this is the club I grew up in and you're you're not comparing like you're comparing apples and oranges. You're, if if I was to stay in my club for the next hundred years, it is not the same exposure that someone like Shane Walsh had with his club in Galway. Like the, just given the the man that are on being a key inter county player in a small parish, it means that you're inevitably you're dragged into sorting out managers. You're you always have to be there. Like there's a real onus on you to to travel to be there. So Shane has given a couple of interviews now to explain his reasons for that. I don't think he's not going to change anybody's mind. To be honest, I don't think. Th- People who've made up their minds from the very moment it was after the more he spoke, they didn't change their minds, and the same is true on the other side. So, I par- pardon me, kind of takes it with a grain of salt. I, I'd say a big thing for Shane Walsh. I remember about a year ago, well, there was there was a bit of talk, all right, that um, when Shane was in Santa College, he was trying to play Sigerson football, that that was something that he was keen to do if it was possible. As it turns out, it wasn't possible. Um, maybe Trench Cup might have been offered to him, but there was no there was no possibility of him playing in Sigurdsson football. But he, uh, the reason that someone like Shane Walsh wants to play in Sigurdsson Cup football because he wants to play on the big stage. He wants the exposure to days like that. So 
You saw how much he thrived on the big day. Twice last year, I would actually maintain the Connor final. He was brilliant against Rush Common last year. The All Ireland final, then again, he was superb. There were two best days last year. I have no doubt we'll see a similar performance of him this year, <laughs> regardless of kind of the chatter that's going on in the background. The Crow Park factor, we were talking to Andrew McGowan a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying, Look, it's great that we get to play there in Leinster, but he didn't think it was that big a factor going into the semi final weekend. Malachy Rourke was pretty honest about it when he spoke um, to the papers in the North at their press day uh, last week, and he said, Look, it's very difficult for Glenn. At least they got to play the semi final there and they've had an experience of a run out, but he was pointing out the chemical croaks have played a lot of championship football in Crow Park over the last two years. And he thinks that that's a distinct advantage for the Dublin champions coming into this weekend. Yeah, it has to be. Like it just that's I think that's inevitable. That's part of the the, the draw, I suppose you could say. Um I thought it was actually I don't want to speak out of both sides of my mouth here because it is definitely an advantage, but at the same time, and I think maybe you might have said similar, when the Leinster semi final draw was made and we heard, found out these teams are playing in Pro Park, I thought that was a brilliant thing. You know, I remember talking to the friends from Tullamore who were so sickened that they didn't get over the, the county final that they because of that opportunity it was on you know, that that was right there for them if they if they were able to do that. So I don't um I don't want to speak out of both sides of motor. I thought it was a good thing that they did that at the time. It just so happens that Kim McCutter are I amidst mean, this incredible period of success also happened to be playing in Co Park. So I don't think that's with something like uh, oftentimes happens in a conversation like this is where we can tend to kind of project sort of frustrations or that the complaints, the to my mind justified complaints people have around Dublin and being in Co Park, for example, get projected down to Kim McCord, whereas I in this circumstance, I can kind of understand how it happened, and I just think it's, it's an unfortunate consequence. I don't think it's it is absolutely an advantage. No question about that, though. And Morris, where do you say see the game being won and lost? Like I'm looking at the, the midfield of Emma Bradley and Connor Glass, and I suppose how Kilmacud got on against Kieran Zarahlis with the likes of David Moore and and his presence in the middle of the field. Do you think that's going to be a key area in the game? Yeah, I, I, actually, I couldn't agree more. Like I think it's I'm actually writing about this for the Examiner this week. I I think it's a like so, if you if you were frustrated by the semi final, particularly actually the Glen Moy Cullen semi final, I don't think you're in for a final that you're going to necessarily enjoy. I don't. I heard you talking about the the games last weekend, the pick of the junior game. Well, I don't think we're going to get that at the weekend. Um, at the same time, I, I do think there's a lot within it that I would personally find interesting. I don't want to be the guy who's talks about fascinating games or that sort of thing uh, at times like this. But I do think there's a lot in this game that is particularly interesting, and a lot of that centers around. Connor Glass. I was just doing some stats for the last weekend. You know, there was this lot of talk and Robbie Brennan was asked about the free count from the semi-final, this 30 versus 8 free count against Kern Rallies. And I actually went and broke it down there early just to see like where, where were these frees coming and what was happening. And it's fairly obvious what was happening. And it's fairly obvious where they drilled down on. So what their game plan was, you know, if you can't, you're not going to stop David Morning in the ground, but you can slow him down in the air. So it'll be no surprise to you, I'm sure, that of those 30 fouls that Kimmel conceded, six were on David Morning, Like six on on one player. Another five were on Gavin O'Brien. Just so happens he's your other kick-out option. He's their second biggest player. He's their wing forward. Uh, Greg Diaz hit seven of those fouls. So seven times did he foul in that game, which I think is a bit kind of ridiculous like that. Like, you know, I, I don't think referees should be in charge of keeping track of this, but for example, in basketball, if you have six fouls, you foul out of a game and there definitely has to be an element. Like, I don't know if you remember, it was his sixth foul, which was a high tackle that he eventually was booked for. But at that stage, so I would see, I would, the reason I bring this up is because I think Connor Glass is in for a very similar experience this weekend. Like I would not be one bit surprised to see something similar, both because he's very hard, he's a similar, a huge platform from a kickout. And the, the whole point, right, is that the, the, the reason the black card was brought in was because if you could stop, especially if after a turnover, like the mass majority of scores come over after a turnover because teams are are unset, you know, they're they're exposed. So how do you stop that? You you foul. Now the problem was that suddenly then the cost went up with a black card. And that's you know. That stops part of the problem, but it stops the whole problem because there still is the same incentive on teams to get a chance to stop and reset and bring back. So they become more intelligent on how they foul. So instead of, for example, pulling a guy down, you might pull his arm back. Remember to tackle on Jack Savage just before half time, something small like that. Um, you might tackle with two hands, you might wrap a guy up, that sort of stuff. And that it just gives you, again, it's a small little thing, chance to stop and reset. Now, I, I should stress, like, I'm not, I would not be critical at all. I think this is the most interesting thing for this game. I, to be honest, because going back to what happened last year, so like you know, what exactly happened in that scenario is that Conor Ferris, the goalkeeper, had the ball, was under pressure and just decided to boot it up the field. And he could go on the attack. Shaden Johnson actually was, is running with the ball, and Andrew McGowan. I don't know if you remember this. He he deliberately like he holds both his hands back up in the air as if to say, "I didn't foul him." Like I didn't, mm -hmm. you know. It was it was very obvious trying to show what he did there, and 
and he didn't foul him. Like you know, there was no free, and they went up and scored a goal. So if he had the chance back again, what do you think he would do? Like there's no doubt what he would do. And yeah. it was your own team. You know exactly what you would ask him to do. So I think that's the most interesting thing. And you go back, like look at this entire year. Like look, look at Kilgore McCord from the first day out in the Dublin Club Championship year. They conceded three goals. They didn't see a single goal in the Championship. They didn't see it against Canary. They conceded three goals all year. Where did those three goals come? One came against Thomas Davis. One came against Kula. One came against Temple Oaks, Sing Street. Two of them were from a side in or a free that was kicked backwards, that was intercepted, and within seven seconds the ball was in the back of the net. So there's no chance to get a hand on there. That's just you know taking advantage of seven seconds from that ball. You, they had the ball. Kim, I'm talking about Kim Good here had the ball. An inaccurate kick pass was intercepted, and within seven seconds it's in the back of the net. That's two other goals. What about the other goal? That goal was against Kula. I don't know if you remember that goal, but it's the exact same passage where Paul Mannion was injured. So here's the ball again. It's a turnover. Actually, there was no free there. Uh, Kim McCoy did foul, but Kula took the free quickly. And in the midst of Paul Mannion being down injured, as it turned out, it was a fairly devastating injury. And them going quickly, they managed to get a goal as well. So that's it's not bulletproof either in terms of the what everyone call it, the strategic fouling. And I'm not like I'm not I'm not glorifying it, or I'm not saying it's it's a good thing. But I'm just saying it's it's part of the game. Like th- this is the reality of the game. I, I was at a coaching conference, a GA coaching conference, a couple of years ago, and uh, I actually couldn't even tell you what the team of the conference was. But as I won't say who. As the coach was going through his slide, uh, he, had, I think by mistake, put up a slide on tactical fouling. And everyone in the room kind of laughed as if to say, you know, we all know this is part of the game. Like every single coach knows this is part of the game. But <laughs> you don't necessarily want to put it up on a, on a board in Crow Park. And so they moved Sophie along and kept talking about what they were talking about. But it is, it's a huge element of the game. So as much as people, I know there was a lot of talk around the free count last year, but I do think, particularly what they do with Connor Glass and how they try and stop goals and how they maintain what is a fairly impressive run of clean sheets will be uh, the most interesting for this weekend. Yeah, many of us felt last uh, time out, Morris, in the semi-final that Moy Cullen didn't mix up the approach of their attack enough, which probably helped Glenn a little bit to get back in numbers and to be as organised as they were. But they were really good at frustrating Moy Cullen. Can they do the same to Kilmacud this weekend? Um, that's a really good question. And uh, there's probably two parts to that. Like, not, not to, I don't want to relitigate that game all over again, but I would just stress as somebody who, who knows that Mike Cullen team, who saw them from the very first day in the Galway Club Championship this year, they're like, Mike Cullen are not Cara Finn, uh, which I think some people might be struggling to understand. Like they were, a, they're a re- relatively new team. They won their first county title two years ago. They came back again and won one this year. And they did that by, they're built on a really hard running, incredibly athletic team, a very well drilled team. But the, the stuff on top of that will eventually come. You know, they don't they don't necessarily have a, a big target on the inside line, for example, like uh, to, to give that kick pass option. They probably wouldn't have the best kick passes at the ball. They have a lot of very big men. They have an absolute gem in Peter Cook. And so uh, it, it basically it meant that the way they were playing this year, it kind of has a scene, like if you can clog up those channels and the fact that they never really developed that kicking game during the year because they didn't need to because they were, could overrun teams. Um, and that would eventually come, like I have no mistake, my corner will come again. But the reason I bring that up is because uh, th- that that's very it's an easier thing to do when a team doesn't have that ability to slightly mix it up in a way that I actually think Kilmacud do have. So just for example, you go back to the semi-final, uh, like Shane Walsh is dropping incredibly deep. And the reason that I think they do that is because he can kind of be a pivot. So instead of being the, the inside target, which is what I think a lot personally I would like to you would like to watch a, a game with Shane Walsh inside target because you get a not on final like last year. He can kind of bring so more attention, and it, it, it's nearly like he's the bridge between, like on the forty, as that kick pass option. At, at times, actually, I would maintain he was going too deep. So I think it's, it's, I don't want to say easier, but it's a, when you're setting out a team to do that, you kind of know that the alternative isn't going to happen, which is the alternative is basically like a, a kick pass in behind, and it's kind of like it becomes a bit more routine in terms of how you set up for a team. So I, I absolutely think that that is what. Now at the same time, right on the other side, I, I do think that. Glenn have the capability to mix it up a bit more as well, actually. So I, like, th- th- I hope we don't get a, a stalemate. I kind of fear we, do, we will, but I hope we won't get a stalemate of both teams settling into that because if we get that kind of mix, it could be a great game. We could have two teams trying to frustrate each other. American Cup on the line this weekend. <laughs> Who do you fancy to win it? Oh, um, uh, if you'd asked me this morning, well, I, I honestly don't know. I, I'm going to say Kim McCoy. I just think the, the, the hurt of last year, they've been going for this They've shown it a very good evolution of what happened last year. As I mentioned, they seem to have learned their lessons from the mistake they made last year. But uh, I like this could be, it could be very similar circumstances where there's a minute left where we might go into extra time and you still don't know who's going to win it. I, w- I would not be expect this to be more than a two point game either way. Right, it's going to be a hell of a battle, Morris. Thanks a million for joining <laughs> us as always. Thanks, lads. So Ash, 
There you go. Two good finals to look forward to this weekend. Um, you've got mm-hmm. one, a football final, which is genuinely incredibly difficult to call. And then you've got a hurling final where you've got an underdog who will feel that they want to banish the pain of their previous trips to the final against the team who are very much expected to win again. Bally Hale, I, I think we're teed up for a good afternoon of action on Sunday. Yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, two great games, two, uh, four great teams that are in it. And I think with Deloy to be here, they're such an exciting team in that semi-final. They absolutely deserve to be in the final. And yeah, can't wait to see what sort of performance they put in against Ballyhale. I do think that Ballyhale will probably just have too much on them. Just that experience, you know, they're in Crow Park time and time again. All of that that comes with it, I think. Yeah, I could see a, a Ballyhale win. But with the football, it's... It's hard to look by Kilmacud, you know, the strength and depth they have. Will Paul Mannion feature, you know, what sort of game will Shane Walsh, will he have the, the game that he had in the All-Ireland final? Do you know, who knows? And to look by them, it's very, very difficult. But I don't know, my gut is telling me that with the midfield, the Glen, Malik O'Rourke on the sideline, the way they're playing, the intensity, the starts they've had in the last couple of games, starting so strong. Yeah, I, I think Glen can get over the line. I will just what about you, Will? I, I think, yeah, I think um, Ballyhill Shamrock's in the hurling and uh, Kilmacud Croaks, but not by much. I, a bit like Morris, I wouldn't be surprised if that game goes to extra time and goes all the yeah. way again like last year. So uh, that should be, I'm really, really looking forward to the football final. Just a quick reminder of the fixtures before we go for this coming Sunday. Uh, so it's hurling, which is going to be up first. You've got Ballyhill Shamrocks against Dunloy. That is the half one throw in at Croke Park. And then two hours later, you've got Glenn against Kimco Croaks. And both finals will be available on TG Carr this coming Sunday afternoon. That's where we take our leave of you. You have been watching and listening to the Club Championship Show on OTB Sports, which is brought to you by AIB. We'll be back next Wednesday for a review of both the hurling and football finals. The Club Championship Show on OTB in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the Football, Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest.